the waters of baptism, cup of salvation, the Holy Bible, God's word to his people. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Warm welcome to all of you who are with us this morning and those who will be joining us as they look at things on the online. Uh, we, in our worship this morning, we have a slight change. Our centering music will be number 50, Shine Jesus Shine, rather than the one that's listed in your, in your bulletin. The number is up on the, up on the board there. Uh, as we gather together as a community, as we, uh, on a Sunday morning, we have concerns and th things that we need to share. And so, at this time, I'd like to invite any announcements from the congregation. Are there any announcements? No announcements? Okay, then let us, uh, let's begin then this morning with our centering music. Again, is number 50. Uh, number 50, Shine, Jesus Shine. The salvation of loving people is from God. God is their fixed point in the troubles of life. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God of unutterable holiness, we confess to you and to each other that we have fallen far short of the complete and generous love of Jesus, our divine brother. Through our foolishness, our very own foolishness, we have not only stumbled, but caused those around us also fall. Through our willfulness, our very own willfulness, we have not only been corrupted, but have aided the corruption of others. Here and now, holy God, through our repentance, our very own repentance, we acknowledge our sins, turn with dismay from them, and pray for your saving grace to once more forgive and rehabilitate our lives. May the Spirit of Christ so to continue to work in and through us that we may forgive those who have sinned against us and sincerely seek their, re their rehabilitation. Through Jesus Christ, our sure Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another. today with an open heart. Amen. I'd like to invite, uh, I see that Finn is with us. Finn, would you join me up here today? You can bring your mom with you. <laughs> This morning, you know what this friend is called? A cactus. Yes, cactuses are very special kinds of plants. I really like them. I brought this. I, whenever I go to Tucson to visit my family down there, I always bring some cactus back with me. Now, do you like hugs, Finn? Do you like to get hugs from your mom? Yes. Do you think you'd hug a cactus? No. <laughs> Nobody hug a cactus. In fact. That's the name of my story this morning. It's called Nobody Hugs a Cactus. <laughs> I thought this cactus looked a lot like the one that I, that I had. Hank lived in a pot. The pot sat in a window, and the window looked out at the empty desert. It was hot, dry, peaceful, and quiet just the way Hank liked it. Hank is the name of the cactus. But every now and then, someone would interrupt Hank's peace and quiet. Hi, 
Hi, Hank, Rosie the Tumbleweed called out. Isn't it a beautiful day? Hank ignored her. He just wanted to be left alone. Ugh. Yeah, he looks grumpy, doesn't he? <clears throat> okay, so long, said Rosie cheerfully, and she tumbled away, and Hank was happy again. But just as he was beginning to relax, Hello, shouted a tortoise. Hello. Private property, yelled Hank. Keep out. The tortoise was so frightened he hid in his shell. Right? This is Hank yelled at him. Look at Hank yelling. <laughs> Hank was still yelling at the tortoise when a jackrabbit dashed by. Hiya, Prickles, he, she shouted. My name isn't Prickles, Hank yelled back, and stay out of my yard. <laughs> Tumbleweeds, tortoises, jackrabbits, what's next, said Hank. A coyote came loping by. No dogs allowed, Hank yelled. I'm not a dog, said the coyote, and you as, are as prickly on the inside as you are on the outside. Before Hank could yell back at the coyote, a cowboy strode past. Keep off the grass, shouted Hank. What grass, said the cowboy. Seems to me somebody needs a hug. Too bad nobody hugs a cactus. <laughs> Hi, said a lizard. Who invited you, said Hank. And just in case you're wondering, I don't want a hug. <laughs> That's good, says a lizard, because I don't want to give you one. And then he skittered away. <coughs> An owl landed on the roof. If you're looking for a hug, said Hank, well, I guess I could give you one. <laughs> Who, me, said the owl? You must be joking. And for the first time, Hank began to feel a little lonely. The next morning, Hank was feeling more sad on the inside than prickly. Maybe a hug wouldn't be so bad after all. Hmm? The wind began to pick up, and an old cup blew by and stuck to Hank's face, and his arms were too short to get it off. Great, said Hank. After a while, Rosie the tumbleweed came bouncing by. I'll get it off you, Hank, she shouted. She jumped up to knock the cup off Hank's face, and then she tumbled away. Hank didn't have time to thank Rosie, and he felt bad about all the other times he had been so rude to her, so he came up with a plan. Hank decided to grow the best flower he could, and then give it to Rosie as a thank you gift. It took days and days, but at last it was ready, and he couldn't wait for Rosie to pass by again. <clears throat> and when at last she finally did come bouncing back, Hank held out the flower. Look, Rosie, he said, I grew it just for you. It looks like a cactus flower. Rosie was so surprised, she jumped up and gave Hank a great big hug. It felt so nice, Hank didn't want to let go, and as things turned out, he couldn't. <laughs> Rosie and Hank had become stuck together, which is what happens when you try to hug a cactus. But they didn't care. After all, it's better to be stuck in a hug than stuck all alone. <laughs> right? Sometimes we feel prickly. Sometimes we don't necessarily want people around and everything, but. You know, there's times when it's always good to be to get a hug and to be, even be stuck in the hug. Sometimes we don't always know when we don't always feel the love that God has for us through Jesus. But he's always out there and he's always waiting for us to get stuck in a hug with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jackson, may we borrow the Bible in you you absolutely, it's not a borrow, it belongs to, belongs to you. Oh, well. As it belongs to all of us. Do you want to bring the, hug, the cactus too? <laughs> do you want to look at that? Or, or do you want to help carry this the big, only thing, big Bible? It really is true that if you try to hug it, you will get stuck. So don't try to touch it. <laughs> so we're going to take this big book back with us.
The word in scripture today is from Genesis and from 1 Corinthians. 1 Genesis 45, 3 through 11. And some context here, this is Joseph upon his return from Egypt where he was sold into slavery. He's meeting his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be famine. There will be, ne there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of, <clears throat> of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, <clears throat> Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you, <clears throat> that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38, and 42 through 50. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life until it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not always sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so were those who are of dust. And is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We continue in our reading of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. And this is Jesus speaking. But I say to you that are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer it the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, 
And if anyone takes away your good, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now there was once a woman who uh, unfortunately had been stuck in a marriage where she was a, one of those long-suffering uh, women and uh, was well known for this and uh, so it was so bad that uh, she longed for the peace and quiet that seemed to be a part of, that was part of the promise of being in heaven. And so the day came when she died and she showed up at the pearly gates and of course St. Peter was there as we know from, from legend and he greets her and says, greeting sister and she says, what are you, are you here for? She says, well I'm here to enter into the peace and quiet of heaven. He says, well welcome. He says, all you have to do is spell one simple word. Spell the word love. Oh, she said, L-O-V-E. And St. Peter says, well of course you can enter into heaven, and he, lets, and he lets her in. He says, oh, while you're here, um, I've, been, I've been on duty for a long time. He says, can you kind of watch the gates for me while I take a little break? And she says, sure, no problem. And uh, if anyone comes, he says, remember, just ask them to spell love. And that's the way they get in. Well, she wasn't there for a few moments when up, through the, up on the golden streets comes her ne'er-do-well husband she thought she was getting rid of. And, uh, and he shows up at the pearly gate. She says, well, hi, how are you doing? And he says, he says uh, I'm here to get into heaven. And she says, she says, well, how did you get here so soon? And he says, well, you know, on the way home from your funeral, I got in a car accident, and here I am. And he says, well, she says, there's just one thing you have to do to get into heaven. And he says, well, what's that? He says, you have to spell Czechoslovakia. <laughs> 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 well, what does mercy look like? Well, it doesn't, certainly doesn't look like that, right? That doesn't look like that. It's not mercy, and that's really not how heaven works either. Heaven works because of the great and wonderful and tender mercy of our God who offers us his great love uh, purely as a gift to each and every one of us. So what does mercy look like? Seems to be sort of the question that Jesus is answering uh, this morning as we continue in the Gospel of Luke. And how do we become people of mercy? We are following Jesus now. And last week we heard of him speaking to a crowd of people on the plane and he gave that, he gave the, uh, a long teaching there. And I think it's very interesting that this particular portion of his teaching starts out, you don't really get it in the translation here, but when you read it in the Greek uh, and the grammar of it is, so um, uh, Jesus, uh, but Jesus he says, but I say to you, those who are still listening, right, those who are still listening, because the three teachings he gave last week are hard, and these are hard teachings also. It is Jesus uh, continuing to manifest 
who God is and what God brings into the world and the new world that God brings and it manifested in Jesus' presence and his teaching and his healings and, his, and everything that he, that he says and does. Uh, when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm really dating myself, but I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm embracing my age and generation, and that is uh, we would get all bundled up on Sunday evenings in our pajamas, and we'd get in, pile into the car, and we'd go over to my great uncle's house uh, to watch Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color. I don't know if anybody else remembers that, but it was in the day when it was about the only show on television that had a segment that was in color. And my great uncle uh, had a color TV set. And uh, so we'd go over there to watch this, these, and the segments were usually these kind of like a serial stories, right? They would tell these stories, the Hardy Boys and things like that, and we'd watch them. And one of my, one of them that I, that I remembered as I was uh, listening to the story that Jesus was telling today was the stories that, a series of stories about Gallagher, a young would-be newsman, right, in the early 20th century. And it always started out with a song, with a song that was, who, what, where, when, why, and how? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Those journalistic questions. And so uh, I started to ask those questions of today's Jesus teachings today. Well, we know the why. We're, we're clued into that. Jesus is here to manifest God's presence in the world and to help us to understand what that means. We have those clues to the why that have been happening uh, as we've been uh, attending to the scriptures for the past few weeks. Jesus is in his person, his presence, his teaching, his words, his healings, a manifestation of God's purpose and continuous presence in the world. Continuous presence in the world, promising us uh, that this world is not the only world that we will know, but that he is bringing a new world into being. The who of the story is Jesus and the crowds, and those who are still listening, and those in the crowd who are still listening to him, right? And the implication is, of course, that some would have gotten said, "Forget it, you know, we don't want to listen to this guy anymore. He's turning everything upside down." And uh, so, uh, so those who are still listening, and I think the the way in which it is that is said to those who are still listening, those who are still listening even now. You and I, we're part of the story. Jesus is speaking to us. And so, and, and, he is, and what he's continuing to do is set the system up on end, upending it, putting everything on its ear. Uh, last week we talked about uh, the system of honor and shame that was part of the culture then and is still part of our culture. The part of the system that Jesus is addressing now when he says, be merciful, as my Father is merciful, and then talks about all these things, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, uh, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. He's turning upside down the system of patronage and of uh, reciprocity. All right, those are, maybe those are big words, I don't know, but patronage and reciprocity, that, and it's basically tit for tat. Right? You get back what you, what, what you, uh, what you give. And uh, he's kind of setting that on its ear and teaching uh, that love and blessing and turning the other cheek and giving without expectation of return are over against the idea of, as he says here, you know, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Right? Right? And uh, the system of patronage that goes along with that. Uh, I, my first real true experience of that, where I was conscious of it, was uh, my brother is a, is, is a year younger than me and is a consummate salesperson. Right? Uh, he overcame a lot of learning disabilities. He, could, he taught himself to read as an adult. He couldn't read and he, and he masked it and hid that just by being able to have that gift of the gap. Right? And um, he operated, and he was, he had a small, he, 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 he worked for a big Toyota dealership in Manhattan, and then uh, opened his own small shop, a sort of a, uh, a, a ballet 
shop where wealthy people would come in from the suburbs with their car. He would pick up their car at their place of work, drive it, and they would do the uh, oil changes and all this stuff and detail the car and then he would pick it up at the end of the day. And, uh, and everything he did was about, uh, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to get that in return. I'm going to do you a favor and I'm going to get a favor in return. And that's, that's patronage, and that's kind of how we still kind of operate that way it's in many ways. The where of, uh, of how Jesus, the where, the place in which Jesus calls us, calls us to consider the idea that we are to love those who hate us and bless those who curse us and pray for those who abuse us and to let go of the idea that we are going to get something in return for everything we do. The where is everywhere that we find ourselves. In fact, the language here is, uh, includes the who, uh, where this happens, is that to anyone, to anyone uh, show this, to anyone bless them, to anyone in any time, in any place. And uh, the where of it, though, challenges us the where of it challenges us to ask the question of, uh, you know, every time I'm with someone and they show a need or they are uh, being particularly rambunctious or there are enemies or present themselves as their enemies, this is a place for us to be this best kind of person that Jesus is calling us to be, right? To let go of what would be normal. What do you do with your enemies, right? Well, you attack them, right? You try to overcome them, right? Those who curse you, you know, you sort of, you can, the very least in the most benign way, you can ignore them, walk away from them, or dismiss them, or in some way, curse them back, right? And Jesus is saying, let go of that. So every time we are confronted with these very real situations, wherever we are, we are challenged. Now, this challenge means that sometimes we have to make choices. We have to make choices. For certainly Jesus is not saying, uh, you know, in blessing those who abuse us or to love our enemies that we are to constantly put ourselves in a place where we are being abused, right? Or where we are being attacked by our enemies. But we are faced with choices. And, and the when of this happening is as contemporary as each of those opportunities present themselves to us. Because the good news, and not the good news, but part of the grace of this scripture where Jesus is calling us into the, being this best self that we, uh, that we know we should be, is that it's not just, it's addressed to all those who are listening. And it's not just putting you on the spot, BG, or you on the spot, John, or you on the spot, Jim. It's all of us in it together. All of us, wherever we are, whenever we are together, whenever we, wherever we are, to continue to ask the question, is this an opportunity? An opportunity for me to love my enemy, to show love, to bless those who curse me, to, uh, to pray for those who abuse. Is this the right opportunity? Tempered with the questions of, is this right and just? And when is it right for me to say, no, it is wrong for you to do these things, right? That's implied, but that's not part of what Jesus is teaching today. He's asking us to be the best that we possibly can be. We know that if we meet violence with violence, we perpetuate the cycle of violence. If we meet curse with curse, we perpetuate the cycle of cursing. If we meet abuse with abuse, we perpetuate the cycle of abuse. That's just common sense. We have examples of that, particularly this week with the celebrations of Martin Luther King, of a, of a man who tried to, who, who did everything and what he did tried to be his best self and to follow these things, but never hesitated when challenged to call people out for, for righteousness sake, for justice sake. He is the one who said in the arc of the moral compass is long, but it 
bends towards justice, right? But he did not meet injustice or hatred with hate. In fact, one of my favorite uh, sayings by him is, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Right? Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So it's addressed the grace note here to all of us in this together, trying to figure out what it means to not meet violence with violence. And so the who continues to be not just me or you, but us, right? All of us who are still listening, <laughs> who are still listening this morning, not just to the preacher, but to what Jesus has to say. It's very, what Jesus is asking of us is very impractical in many ways, and sometimes darn near impossible. It sounds utopian, right? And we know what happens to utopian ideas and ideals and communities. They, they flourish and then they wither on the vine because people cannot keep up with all the demands of that. You know what utopia means, right? It's, it's a play on Greek words. It means you, uh, the prefix you, which means good, and top, top, topos, which means place, a good place. Very funny series streaming online for a couple of seasons now called The Good Place. Right? Have you seen, it, seen that at all? Very funny, uh, very satirical, and the idea is it looks like a utopia, but often what looks like a utopia never is. Right? You know what, uh, in the system of patronage that Jesus is upending, it seems impossible to us because the whole world is based on that. You remember that great scene from The Godfather? Early on in the movie, at the wedding, and one and a man comes named Bonacera, right? Comes to the Godfather, asking with his sad story of his daughter who had been raped by a couple of young men and then uh, had gotten off scot free with their sentence, uh, you know, basically suspended. And he wanted the Godfather to do something about it, which meant that he wanted the Godfather to kill him, right? To get rid. That's certainly not what what is here in this story, but Bonacera comes to him and asks him the favor and the Godfather chastises him for never having come, darkened his door, never been his friend, never done anything, and why do you, why do, you do this? And finally, the Godfather relents, but here's the patronage, right? Bonacera, I will do this thing for you, right? I will do this thing, but someday, and that day may never come, I need to ask you a favor and you will do that favor for me. All right, that day may never come. There's a threat there, isn't there? That day may never come, but it may. That's patronage, right? And that's what Jesus is turning upside down. You know, the, the, the second reading today in Corinthians uses that beautiful image, imagery of seed, right? Of seed, that each of us, that we're kind of, St. Paul speaks of us as if each of us is a seed. Each of us individual, uh, sprouting into who knows what, just as individual as we are, right? The seed imagery, that within each of us is that potential for God to be revealed in his great mercy, the mercy that he shows. And so we keep asking the question of ourselves, you know, how do I be merciful as God is merciful? How do I be merciful as God is merciful? As, is merciful as individual as each of us is an individual seed and holds that potential, and as much of a community as all of us are addressed by this, we know that when we come together, that there is a bigger picture. Right? There is a seed that was sown that um, that was sown for the sake of all. We hear it, I love the, this verse from Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and following. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's mercy. That's God's compassion and tender mercy towards us. Not requiring anything of us, but that while we were yet sinners, Christ would die for us. And as we, hear, as we progress in the story of Jesus and move forward, we also go back to the beginning in Luke chapter 1, 
is the story of Jesus being presented at the temple and the old man, the old priest Zechariah is there and he breaks out into song and he recognizes in the infant child and you child will be called the prophet of the Most High for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Through the tender mercy, the tender mercy alone of our God, when the day shall dawn upon us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. There is one seed that was cast into the ground, one seed that was raised up again into new life, the one who shows the tender mercy of our God in his very person from the beginning to the end and continues to make known that tender mercy to each and every one of us. In the little things and in the big things, we are not alone. This story continues to come to us who are still listening, speaking to our hearts, offering us again and again the opportunity that as we fail, and as we always do, as we fail to be merciful, as God is merciful, to seek repentance, to seek in repentance a restoration of our, our, our relationship with this Christ who died for our sins. And to hear again and again out of the tender mercy of God, our sins are forgiven. Forgiveness. And to receive the consolation of that forgiveness, of a conscience that needs no longer be, be, uh, be caught up in anxiety and worry and fear about being good enough or have I done enough or have I done enough to deserve God's love. All of that has been turned upside down. For God's tender mercy, God's tender mercy <clears throat> looks like, acts like, talks like, walks like his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has come to dwell in and amongst us, calling us each and every one, but calling us together also to live in the mercy that he gives to us through this same Jesus Christ, to be, to be together merciful as God is merciful. Amen.
Would the ushers come forward? Upon this bright mountain you bless us with your presence and shower us with the gift of your grace. May our offering of these gifts be used to reflect that bright grace in a word in a world in desperate need of it. Amen. Amen. seed 
that is put into, gr into the ground to bear fruit in its due season. May that fruit be the fruit of love and justice and mercy. God of mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. We pray for those who are ill or in the hospital. We pray for Leah, a beloved cat who is very ill. And uh, we pray out loud or in our hearts for all those who are in our hearts and minds uh, as, they, uh, as they struggle with illness. To the family and loved ones of Uncle S who uh, has gone on to meet you, Lord. <clears throat> For Polly's and my friend Sherry, whose um, urothelial cancer has spread to her brain. For her husband and her friends and for Polly, who's especially being supportive of her. For our friend, uh, Amy Cronkey, who's on the ACC recovering from cancer surgery. For my friend, Bob Payne, and my friend, Tommy Graves. God of mercy, hear our prayers. God, you continue to show in your wisdom the great mercy towards the world. We experience through you a love which has no end. We pray also for continued wisdom in our own lives as we are challenged, challenged to <coughs> love, our, love our enemies and to bless those who curse us. We pray also for just wisdom for everyday life. We pray for the Thomasons for wisdom and hope. God of mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. All these things we ask in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 356, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Amen.